Welcome to the overview of Chapter 8, Chapter 25 in the book book, looking at long-run economic growth. I'm glad you've joined me. I hope you find this helpful. So what are we going to look at in this chapter? We're going to look at long-run growth, kind of tying all of this together, what we've looked at in this uh, semester of macroeconomics, looking at um, what are some of the sources of long-run growth? How do we look at uh, real GDP in terms of looking at growth rates uh, country to country over, over time? And then uh, what are some productivity aspects uh, that lead to long-term growth? And how do, we, how do we graph that? When in doubt, graph it out. Um, this also leads to the idea of the convergence hypothesis, and we'll talk about what that is and, and uh, whether or not, uh, again, uh, debatable, whether or not that is um, a real thing and if it, is, uh, it, if it is happening and occurring or going to be happening and uh, where that may take shape. Uh, and then we'll look at the idea of sustainability and, and some of the issues that we're taking on from a macroeconomic point of view today uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the global marketplace and the challenges that are created there. Um, as always, there are a number of explainers out there that I think you'll find most helpful on long-run economic growth. Um, so do check those out. There are four here uh, from things like Khan Academy, ACDC Econ, Jason Welker, and you'll love economics. Um, we uh, start by looking at Activity 6-1, some review of long-run aggregate supply in the PPC. You may remember um, that uh, the idea of long-run aggregate supply is really this curve here, this long-run aggregate supply curve, really is uh, a microcosm down here in the small portion of where we see consumer goods. That essentially is the start of the uh, long-run aggregate supply that creates the PPC, or the production possibilities frontier, uh, if you will. And so um, by looking at this, kind of in, in that lens, by looking at LRAS as, as kind of part of that PPC, uh, we can see that long-run, when we shift the long-run aggregate supply outward or rightward, uh, we are growing the PPC. We're growing the production possibilities uh, that our economy has. And so what we will find is that economies uh, typically, we hope, are growing. Uh, and over time and space, um, they will continue to grow, uh, as we have seen. Now, some grow faster than others. Some have a faster growth rate, and we'll talk about that, a higher growth rate. Um, and we really want to look at real GDP per capita in terms of making this happen. Uh, why per capita? Because it's per person. Uh, you can look at an economy and think that it's growing uh, exponentially by leaps and bounds, but when you divide it by the number of people that are in the country, it's not quite uh, a standard of living that, that is as high as we may like uh, or we would like to see in that type of a country. Uh, we look at the real GDP per capita uh, of the United States, and we can see whether we're looking at 1900 or whether we're looking at 2010, we can see that the growth rate is consistent, uh, that we are cons consistently growing our real GDP, and this is continuing to improve over time. Uh, whether you're looking at 1900 as the base year or 2010 as the base year, both show us uh, that real GDP per capita uh, our real GDP is growing uh, in, in that regard. Now, it's important to note, uh, we talked about the per capita, but we didn't talk about the real GDP. Real GDP is essentially taking inflation out of the picture. So uh, this is without inflation, just focused on, on GDP uh, alone, and then a, a per capita being per person. So we're, we're focused on uh, taking inflation out of this picture, uh, dividing it by the total number of the population in that country, and that gives us real GDP per capita, which is where we uh, we get these uh, statistics. So, looking at the overall glo the global um, uh, the global marketplace uh, and how countries are stacking up on real GDP uh, around the world, uh, we can see that uh, the rising tide has tended to to lift a lot of boats, but not all boats. Uh, we can see the um, the oranges and the yellows uh, in this space are really showing us uh, that. While um, improvement in technology and shifting out the LRAS curve, shifting out the PPC, is essentially helping a lot of countries, uh, and, and trade is definitely helping with that, absolutely, um, very effective in, in terms of uh, promoting um, economic um, uh, wellness and, and um, uh, that sort of thing down the road. Now this will take us back to a conversation we're going to have at the end about convergence hypothesis, but it is important to note that we see a lot of countries that are benefiting from global trade. We're seeing a lot of, uh, and, and this is growing real GDP. It is helping countries to uh, extend or expand their standard of living and really helping them to, to grow and um, trade with others, with other countries, is also critical here. 
that doesn't always extend to all of the countries uh, that we can see, and that, that's the important point we want to notice, which we'll talk about uh, here in a moment regarding the uh, convergence hypothesis. Uh, but let's talk for a second about this growth rate. So what happens? How does the United States get to a growth in real GDP per capita from 1900 to 2010? Well, uh, it doesn't just all of a sudden bloom and explode on the stage. It's a little bit at a time. It's a little bit of growth that happens uh, over time, and that leads to this long-run economic growth we're talking about. 1.9% each year must, may not seem like a lot, but when you, uh, when you look at it and you add it up over the, over the decades, over the years, over the decades, um, over the um, 100 years that we're talking about, you can see the growth rate is actually quite high. And the impact is significant in that um, trading with other countries can also help uh, those nations, uh, their economic standing and their real GDP as well. So it's about taking a little bit at a time and really focusing on how can we grow real GDP um, this year, how can we re grow real GDP next year, and really taking those gains and add it up over time, we can see the significant growth uh, that is established. Now, growth rates. Uh, let's talk for a moment, and this also applies to uh, financial literacy from a personal finance point of view. Uh, the rule of 70, or it's also sometimes called the rule of 72, uh, is focused on growth. How long does it take for money uh, investments to double uh, over time? Uh, the, the concept is essentially that you take the number 70 and you divide it by the rate of growth. So if we had that 2% growth rate that you saw there, that 1.9% we saw in uh, real GDP per capita, and uh, we use we divide 70 by that 2%, we can see it would take about 35 years for the economy to double uh, in terms of that investment. Uh, the same is true for your finances. If you take $10,000 and you put it in, uh, in into a savings account that gives you 2%, uh, it is it is going to take you 35 years to double your money. Now, obviously, you want a higher growth rate. Uh, you find something that is uh, probably more risky, uh, but more lucrative, uh, more more beneficial and and profitable as a result. If you get a 7% growth rate, you would see that it would only take about 10 years uh, to double. So a 7% rate, um, pretty unrealistic uh, uh, from a from a nation's point of view in terms of growth, uh, not impossible, but very hard to maintain, very hard to maintain a growth rate of 7%, especially as your economies get larger. So what we can see here is China can can do 8.9% or 8% in terms of its growth, but it's very hard to maintain that year after year after year. Uh, and as your economy grows, again, the idea there is it is the entire economy that you're growing by an additional 7 or 8 or 9% next year therein lies the problem. So uh, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, the idea of a little bit at a time is really the growth that we see there. Uh, we can see significant spurts in growth uh, in terms of what's happening here, but um, just a 1.9 or 2% growth rate uh, can be significant over a longer period of time. It just depends on how long do you have. Now, probably the most important slide in terms of long-run growth is where does this growth come from? It comes from four places. It comes from uh, labor productivity, and that uh, ties into human capital here, the idea of labor, people working. Um, the, the productivity or the output per worker is really important here because it really showcases how productive is a worker in terms of the job that they do. The more productive they are, the more they can produce, the more profitable we can be, the more we can grow real GDP. So that is significant here for long-run growth of a nation, an economy, a business, whatever. Um, and the idea of, of labor productivity is really uh, vital and really uh, key uh, to that success. Physical capital, also important. Uh, we don't see as much growth here as we do in, in labor, productivity, and technology. But uh, physical capital is important. The more we are building better, bigger, faster, and, and more innovative and more efficient machines and buildings uh, that can withstand the, the growth and the capacity uh, to be more productive, the more uh, we can see long-run growth growing and expanding uh, at that 2% or higher uh, rate that we've talked about. Human capital is important here as well uh, when you think about not just labor and their productivity, but also how they engage in the workforce, how they engage in 
growing the economy and being more productive. Um, and this includes things like education, a focus on uh, education and focus on innovation in, in educating workers to not just be workers and that are punching a clock, but people that are truly suggesting ideas, providing ingenuitive uh, ways to do things and, and to do things, again, more efficiently. Uh, that helps to grow real GDP. So in the long run, uh, the uh, workforce is more educated, uh, more knowledgeable, more innovative, and can contribute to new ways of and new technologies we haven't even thought of yet. And that leads to the last um, item, the last source of long-run growth, which is technology. Technology is really important here because in long-run growth, when you're focused on um, uh, growing the uh, real GDP and growing um, the economy, technology is important. And technology not just in terms of computers and faster computers, but in terms of ways of doing things. This goes back to productivity. Uh, if we can use the technology and use uh, our, our digital footprint in a way that allows us to be more productive and find new ways and uh, to to improve technology and and new and create new technologies as a result of the of the technological progress we have made that also contributes to long run growth and is really important here in terms of uh, really driving uh, that growth over time. Now. The production function in terms of real GDP is really the, an equation taking those sources of long-run growth and applying them to this uh, equation, this production function, if you will. Uh, the uh, production function is made up of Y, which you will remember is real GDP. Uh, the idea of Y or yield is, is essentially real GDP divided by labor, divided by that labor uh, that we have out there. And this is equal to the function of uh, the capital uh, that we talked about, those uh, that physical capital, the the, the capital resources, uh, the buildings and tech, uh, the the buildings and uh, machines and technology that we see there, um, divided by the labor, as well as the human capital divided by labor and the technology uh, that we see out there. So this essentially isn't really uh, I've not seen it used in an equation. I've seen it more uh, used in terms of how do we get to that real GDP. Uh, per capita, we look at the functions of combining technology, human capital, and physical capital, and we use them together in a way that allows us to be more innovative, more productive, uh, and produce more to grow our real GDP per capita. And we're using those workers uh, effectively to do so. That really is the, uh, the driver here in terms of what we're focused on. Now, uh, why is it that China grew faster than India? Uh, in the examples that we looked at just a moment ago, you can see the growth rates, 8.9 uh, versus 4.2%. Why is that? Well, um, a lot of it is, is because of opportunity cost, because of decisions that have been made in terms of how China invests their dollars uh, to spend those in a way that are more helpful or productive uh, for their, their economy, for, for their real GDP. Uh, and India may not have um, may not have done that. Now, there's other aspects of this that we're going to talk about in a minute uh, that tie into this as well. Uh, but looking at the human capital, looking at the physical capital, looking at the technology, uh, wh what's the difference here? Uh, they probably weren't both applying the same amount of, of uh, aggregate production function in the same ways. Uh, it probably wasn't the, the same amounts. Uh, but we can see uh, just a little bit applied in certain ways can make a big difference in terms of uh, growth in real GDP. And so that's really a, a lot of what we see in, in nations that are growing exponentially uh, and, and nations that are growing but aren't growing at as fast a pace uh, as we would, uh, such as what we see in India, uh, as, as such a fast pace as we would see in China. So um, that is significant here. And, and their technological progress, their focus on education, uh, the importance of education, and and part of this is also cultural. I mean, uh, the the Chinese society is really focused on you know you you work hard, you um, you get an education, you focus on uh, doing well, and and using those skills to innovate and come up with new ideas uh, that can then. Um, help grow uh, real GDP, help grow society as a whole. And, and that can help as well. And especially uh, when you have a number of people that you're educating, a number of people that are helping to be more innovative, uh, that definitely improves the dynamic uh, when there are more, uh, when there, when there is um, more people that have been educated in that regard. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't f diminishing returns. Uh, physical capital, we talked about 
the idea of uh, buildings and machines. Uh, physical capital is only going to get you so far. Uh, it is going to increase and it's going to improve, and we continue to see this increases and improvements, uh, but it is going to diminish over time. You may remember uh, the um, diminishing returns to labor we talked about in microeconomics, the idea that as we add more one more worker doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we're going to add the same level of productivity uh, as the previous workers that we've added. Uh, we're still going to grow, uh, but we're not going to grow at the same rate as what we would uh, with the uh, previous workers we had otherwise. And, and physical capital in the macroeconomic world uh, is very similar to this. When we have diminishing returns on physical capital, we're looking at a growth rate that is still positive, it is still growing, uh, but it is growing at a slower rate. Uh, and so we can see it starts to slow down here. That first 1%, 0.75% of, of productivity growth. Uh, the second 1%, uh, 0.66, and then the third, 0.50. So we can see there is diminishing returns to physical capital. The idea is we are growing, we are improving, but we're doing it at a slower rate. At a slower rate, things are slowing down in terms of what we see there. And that really is um, that diminishing returns to physical capital that we see. Now, um, that does lend itself to the idea that over time uh, we will continue to see growth and we'll continue to see that productivity because we're building on the foundations of previous uh, years and, and, and GDP that has been produced. So if you look at 1940s technology in the United States and then you look at 2010 technology, you can see um, that by taking uh, the, the, the views of history, we are improving our technology uh, through, in many cases, productivity just by looking at how we can build on technologies we have in order to create and innovate and develop new technologies that can help grow our economy even greater than it was before. And so you can see uh, that the growth of techn technological progress is greater here. It improves productivity, it adds to real GDP, and ultimately improves real GDP per capita. So it's still positive. Uh, but it is growing, it's just growing at a slower rate in terms of what we see here. So what about natural resources then? Uh, why is it that Japan uh, has very few natural resources but sees a, a GDP that, that is growing um, much faster than a lot of other countries that are out there, such as Nigeria, that is sitting on the fifth largest oil deposits in the world? It is a resource-rich country, um, but it is not effective in terms of its leadership. We have corruption, waste, fraud, and abuse going on uh, with governmental leadership. And that can have an impact on the economy, definitely so, uh, in these cases when it comes to use and utilization of natural resources. So these growth rates differ because of a number of factors. Um, and I use the Japan and Nigeria example as, as one, uh, one really con big contrast uh, to what we see here because how countries value and uh, promote uh, savings and investment spending uh, can have an impact. Uh, those countries that are focused on savings, focused on investments uh, in their technologies, in their uh, infrastructure, in education, um, those investments are going to pay off exponentially in terms of growing real GDP, in, in terms of growing uh, their assets uh, that they see out there. Uh, foreign investments, uh, getting foreign investments uh, both uh, investments you are making abroad as well as those that are coming in are also uh, having a, a significant impact. Uh, we see a lot more investments in Japan uh, than we do in Nigeria in terms of uh, in terms of foreign investment and also in, in, in uh, the other way around. Education is another good example. Japan very focused on education, much like we talked about with China. Uh, very much a part of the culture uh, to focus on getting a good education. They are not going to go out and work in coal mines. Uh, that is not going to be the industry that is going to propel Japan to long-term real GDP growth. It's going to be in education. It's going to be in new ways of doing things. Uh, and and their, um, one of their most valuable resources is their human capital, uh, are the people uh, that they have that are, that are finding new ways of doing things, finding uh, new ways of, of producing products. Uh, and using education to do that is really uh, one significant example of how you can grow real GDP. Infrastructure is another. Uh, focusing on infrastructure, being able to uh, produce products isn't enough. You have to get them from one place to another. So having... Um, uh, uh, shipping yards and docks and uh, places where exports and imports can take place. Uh, the Port of Baltimore is a great example of this. 
having a significant infrastructure uh, is important. Uh, why uh, do places like Seoul, uh, Korea, and uh, and Japan focus on uh, infrastructure? Because it is important to, um, uh, to to what they are trying to do if they're going to grow GDP in areas of shipbuilding uh, and in areas of, of car production. Uh, those are really important uh, that we see there. I toured a, a Kia plant um, in, when I when I taught for a summer in Seoul, South Korea, and the um, the Kia plant um, really was focused on how, how can we get this car produced and onto a ship and uh, and and exported to other countries. Uh, that's a part of infrastructure, uh, and that infrastructure is significant. So uh, focusing on that is really important. We hear the Biden administration talking a lot about that right now, um, the importance of infrastructure uh, in terms of promoting real GDP growth, uh, and that is um, never more evident uh, than we see uh, today. Even in a services-based economy, uh, you still need infrastructure in term, uh, infrastructure and education in terms of uh, growing uh, your GDP. Research and development is important here too. You think about the coronavirus vaccine and um, trying to get people to focus on something quickly but safely and, um, and using technologies uh, in order to get us back to the new normal. Uh, research and development, very important here. And not just in the area of medicine uh, or viruses, but also in the areas of uh, all kinds of research that is done uh, for technologies, uh, for new technologies that are being created, developed. Um, the new technologies that in 20 years we haven't even started using yet, but will be coming of age and will be significantly different uh, in terms of our our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, we can't even imagine the types of things uh, that are being developed and researched right now uh, that are in the testing phase or haven't even been thought of yet. Uh, they are they are ideas that in the waiting uh, that are coming from research and development. This is important in terms of how it impacts growth rates. Um, the political stability is important. I mentioned Nigeria, uh, governments that are corrupt and governments that are keeping economic growth from happening. Uh, if you look at Venezuela, uh, you look at Myanmar, um, a number of countries in which when the, when the uh, political environment is unstable, you have countries uh, that, that don't want to... Um, that don't want to engage in business development with those nations because they're not sure that their investments will be safe, will be secure. Um, and that is a, a, an important aspect of growth. If you can't have a stable political environment, how do I know the investments I'm making in your country are going to pay me dividends? How do I know I'm going to even get the money back, let alone any profits uh, from what um, I'm investing? So that's really important in terms of long-term real GDP growth. And then uh, that ties into property rights in terms of safety and security of property, uh, making sure that businesses that are invested and countries that are invested uh, are able to see the, the fruits of their labors. Um, and this is why we see in East Asia a lot of growth in the, in the uh, real GDP that we've seen over time. Uh, they have focused on education, but, but so have a lot of Latin American nations. Uh, but a lot of those concerns that we just talked about, the focus on education, the focus on research and development, foreign investment, um, political stability, all of this is driving real GDP. It's not just education alone. It's education in concert with these other factors that can have a significant impact here. So think of this list not as a pick and choose multiple choice of one item, but multiple items uh, that that are fused together in terms of creating an environment that grows real GDP. Argentina is a great example of this. Uh, they're trying to step up their 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 uh, advances in growing their real GDP by focusing on education. That's important, but it's only one piece of the equation. China focusing on education and increasing their their focus and spending around education and, and knowledge capital. But the idea here is it's going to take time. Argentina is not going to catch up with China in terms of real GDP just because they throw money at it for 50 years around education. It's a combination of things. You got to have political stability. You got to have infrastructure. You got to have technologies and uh, research and development as part of that. So it's a much bigger equation than just uh, one particular aspect of that those sources of long-run growth. And that's what's really going to drive GDP. That's what's really going to drive the GDP per capita that we're talking about here. So it's not just productivity. It's not just human capital. It's a combination of all of these things working together. That's what's really driving real GDP growth in the countries that we're seeing. Uh, poor countries uh, do a lot more regulating, uh, a lot more regulating in terms of what we see here. The poorer countries tend to cling to the uh, 
uh, what's worked in the past. Well, we've always done it this way and this has worked for us. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work now. And so you have to change with the times, change with the technology. And countries that do that and find ways to be more innovative and grow are the ones that are going to see improvements in their real GDP. The ones that cling to the, the eras of the past are going to find uh, that they're not going to grow as quickly. And again, that combination of those sources of growth is going to keep them from being successful. And that's what we see in places like Nigeria. We, we're seeing improvement in places like Argentina. And then we're seeing significant growth in places like South Korea. Uh, as I'm, and China, as I mentioned. Um, again, because it's that combination of those resources of growth that are really going to be driving uh, the day here in, in terms of what we see, which leads to this idea of a convergence hypothesis. Um, the uh, focus here is, are these countries converging? Are all of the economies just melding into one giant economy, the global economy that we see time and time again here. And this is why we're seeing all of the purple growth uh, in terms of the um, overall growth rate of GDP across the board. Well, um, is it a convergence hypothesis? Uh, you could look at the map and, and say it would seem so, but why are all these other nations being left behind? Well, because it's a it's a yes and no answer. It's not just all of these countries are converging and, and all of a sudden real GDP is growing. Uh, what we're finding is that wealthy countries are being successful uh, and the wealthier countries have more resources to devote to it. Uh, countries in Africa don't have the resources to devote to education. They don't have the resources to devote to infrastructure and research and development or new technologies. So they're already behind in terms of uh, what they could be doing. And then trying to catch up makes it even harder, as we saw in, in that Argentina example. It's much harder to catch up uh, when you're already starting from a place that is not equitable, that is not a level playing field. And so uh, that really is uh, the concern of the 21st century that we will see is how do we try and make that more equitable? How do we bring along those other countries in terms of trying to get them into the fold and um, the EU is seeing this uh, as well. You know, you've got Britain and Germany and France, kind of the, the dominators, Spain and Italy, uh, that, are, that are dominating um, the EU market. But then you've got other countries of the, in Western Europe that are really struggling uh, and, and struggling to, um, to grow their real GDP per capita. And so how do we bring those along? The EU is really struggling with that. Greece is a great example, has, a, uh, has had problems with government and problems with debt. And how do, we, uh, how do we drive that home? And how do we uh, really turn that into a real GDP per capita that is growing? That is one of the major challenges and the obstacles uh, that the EU has today, the European Union has uh, today. Uh, it used to be you could rely on oil, uh, that you could rely on oil as your backdrop. But as we're seeing, uh, that's not as important anymore. Um, and uh, the Biden administration talked about this, uh, Joe Biden talking about, uh, you can't just focus on the old um, uh, standby modalities uh, that you worked in the past. You've got to focus on what's new, what, what's, uh, where there's the economy headed, um, and focusing on what futurists uh, call the, the new era of, of growth. And that is really where we see a lot of companies, GM, for example, focusing on electric vehicles, Tesla, uh, focusing on how can we utilize new technologies to grow uh, our company and ultimately grow our GDP. In the, in the long run, uh, we need to be focused on where the economy is going, where the globe is going in terms of this. So are we seeing growth in oil? No, we're not. We're seeing growth in, in new energy spaces. And that leads us to conversations about climate change and the focus on greenhouse gases. Uh, whether you like climate change or, or you think it's a myth or, or, or supportive of it, whatever, uh, doesn't matter. But uh, you've got to understand where the economies of the world are going. And China is already all over this uh, in terms of, uh, of what, they're, what they're focused on. Uh, why are they doing this? Because they have significant carbon dioxide problems. Uh, emissions are, are intense there. How do, we, how do we change that? Well, without new technologies, with that, without uh, focus on electric cars and other fuel and um, uh, resources, you're not going to turn that ship around. And so uh, what we are seeing is com companies and countries that are focused on uh, these new technologies around a green platform, uh, around green energy, around finding new and renewable resources uh, that can be used um, 
to uh, to do many of the the run of the mill tasks that we've done uh, in the past. Uh, getting outside of oil and uh, outside of uh, coal and gas, and really focused on uh, how do we drive uh, new energy. Wind uh, wind farms are a big a uh, big thing. We see solar panels, we see electric vehicles, um, fuel cells, and uh, whatnot. Uh, these are drivers of growth. GM sees this as the, the cars of the future. They've put a lot of money and research and development into these spaces. Why? Uh, because they know that that's uh, where the global economy is going and they want to go with it. They don't want to be left behind. Uh, so whatever uh, the uh, whatever the, the country may decide to do or not to do, that really isn't their focus. The focus is on where is the economy going, the global economy, where is it going, and how can we uh, profit from it? How can we make money in it? And that's really uh, their, their, their mantra in terms of their focus on electric vehicles. Um, we've heard about carbon taxes. We've heard about cap and trade systems. Those, a lot of those have fallen flat in Congress. We haven't really seen a whole lot of change in terms of where the economy is headed here and that's not a surprise um, when you have uh, a system that is that is pretty 50 50 in terms of representation by democrats and republicans we're not going to see a whole lot of change there that that's moving in one direction or another cap and trade was a a concept that was adopted and uh and and then was was uh basically uh lambasted by the uh, fuel industry and and it kind of uh, has lived to see another day here and there, but uh, but nobody's really talking uh, much about uh, it, it going anywhere anymore in terms of uh, of what we see there. The growth is really in uh, renewable resources and uh, how do we reduce emissions? How do we um, find new ways of doing what we normally do in our 24-hour day? Um, whether that's in a car, getting around, using electric vehicles, or, or uh, mass transit buses, or uh, even uh, the purple line focused on uh, mass transit in, in other uh, train capacities. Um, the idea here is how do we focus on the future, focus on uh, the long-term growth and um, where the uh, global economy is headed, uh, at least for the wealthy countries, hoping that other countries can participate and, uh, and, and be a part of that. But again, there is a, a vast dichotomy between the two. Um, activity 6-3 is about uh, policies that promote this type of economic growth. You can check that out. We're going to uh, uh, take a look at that in class as well. Uh, there's a significant number of uh, summaries that I would urge you to check out here uh, as well and uh, some key terms in terms of uh, what to know. Remember the rule of 70, labor productivity, aggregate production function, those diminishing returns to capital, and there are a number of explainers to help take you through that as well. Here are the answers to the take-home quiz questions to check those out. The uh, answers with explanations are posted on the module section of my MCPS classroom. I would urge you to also check your answers and then come to class with questions that you may have, uh, but hopefully uh, you will find those helpful. And lastly, there are some sample questions for this particular chapter, uh, again, that I think you will find helpful, so do check those out. Uh, along these lines of long-run economic growth, some practice questions uh, that, that are similar to the types of questions you would see on a quiz, the test, or the AP exam. And that wraps up our overview of long-run economic growth, looking at Chapter 8 in the uh, online PDF, Chapter 25 in the book book. And I hope you found this helpful. Have a great day, and we will see you in the next chapter on global trade and looking at foreign exchange. Until then.